the potential gain is not even that great. Exactly. And the potential loss is something. I don't understand why Watch fam, I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. My name is Michael, and this video is sponsored by iRestore. More on them and their incredible restoration process uh, in just a bit. Yes. Uh, Michael and I are wearing the same jacket, or very similar jacket, because yes. Michael got me this jacket, and you know, whatever. It was both uh, rainy ha, and cold. Ha, 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 I get it. <laughs> I know? get it. We like yellow. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was both rainy and cold, and I grabbed this jacket and knowing you, you were getting it, too. Yeah. How depressing would it be if I didn't wear it? Uh, it was bizarre. Yeah, I would have thought about it later. You would have been later like, hey, by the way, did you like the jacket I've been like you? those jeans I got you. <laughs> no, I like those jeans. Yeah, of course, of course. I've seen them being worn. <laughs> a total of four times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So today we're reacting to a Bark and Jack video. Bark and Jack is a popular YouTube channel yes. um, about watches. Yes. Adrian is the host. And he released a really interesting video recently um, about a error dial Rolex Explorer. And it's a bizarre watch. And it's fucked. Yeah. The story's kind of up um, and it raises some interesting questions, but it really does answer a question: Who's responsible for this very clear error? Yeah, what happened? Is it an individual, or is it Rolex as an institution? And and depending on your answer, then what is the punishment for this? And frankly, you know? the uh, dumb thing to say, but it's true: Who's responsible for making that dial? Right, who's responsible for even manufacturing the error, not to mention letting it go out on the market. It's a bizarre conversation. We're going to start off with um, a kind of a brief history of Rolex errors, Rolex mistakes. Uh, and I think that that history starts in the 1950s. Yes. Well, what's on your wrist? Oh, I'm wearing my grandfather's vintage uh, Patek Philippe, Calatrava, um, a watch that we gave to him for his 80th birthday. There's actually a video about it. I watched uh, that video. It was a good video, it. you know, it was a good, you know, for back yeah. then. You know, it was a good video. Um, anyway, um, but what's what's cool about this watch is it's it's huge. The lugs are huge. Um, it's just it's just a beautiful <laughs> what that watch. Like is, if you think that's yeah, big, what's what's the millimeters? It is a large like a watch. Thirty-five, but the look the, the lugs are so thick and girthy. It is a large watch, but just that statement is so funny to anyone outside of the vintage world. Yes, You're like this that, watch is it's, it's massive. enormous. It's, it's enormous. It's enormous. How big is it? It's about thirty-five. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, this is a very cool watch that I'm wearing today. I'm probably going to give it to my grandfather again today and tell him to start wearing it. So. What about the Fenty? The, yeah. Oh, my God. My grandfather has a Patek Philippe and a Fendi watch. And he a prefers to Fendi wear the watch. Fendi watch. <laughs> as opposed to the very nostalgic Patek Philippe that we gave him. He'll have the Patek okay. Philippe. No one else might have He'll have the Patek, Patek on his wrist. And because she'll be like, what watch are you wearing? And he goes, a Fendi. Oh, not Fendi. Uh... Patrick. You're like, <laughs> Patrick. Oh, St. Patrick's Day, March 16th. <laughs> yeah, he completely forgets you're talking about it already. <laughs> you're making corned beef, your mother's going to make it. <laughs> eh. I'm like, yeah. You know, your mother makes it the Italian way. I said, what's that way? He goes, with flavor. <laughs> Every year, same joke. 28 years. 28 same years, same joke. I am wearing the Super Seawolf from Zodiac, and it's a uh, Huckberry piece. You actually, really like that watch. I think it's great, too. You I, wear it a lot. Yeah, I love this watch. It's just, it's 42 millimeters, which I can never pull off on my tiny baby wrist. Yep. But for some reason, I feel like it's all good. Yeah, I'm a big Huckberry fan. I wear a lot of their clothing. Uh, I wear a lot of their clothing. Yeah. And then when I saw that they had a watch shop, I thought it was like, okay, it was a little bit boring, who, another watch shop. And then I was like, oh, wait, their selection of watches is actually pretty pretty great. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually a big Zodiac fan. They have Unimatic as well. And um, I don't know. I've been sending the Huckberry watch shop out to folks who specifically are like, hey, I'm looking to buy you know a, a watch for my son or watch for myself. I want to stay under four grand. Like, <laughs> Sorry, I keep laughing. I keep remembering. I'm being very serious. About this. Uh, this is my dream to match with people that yeah. I love. <laughs> oh, Sally I, will never match with me. I got Christian this jacket. This is Manufactura Cicarelli mm. because. Hey, pretty good. I know, right? I had to say it because I was doing a video on this. Yeah. But um, I got this for Christian because Sally, his girlfriend, wears a yellow jacket in the winter all the time. And I know that you love matching with her. I love matching. Yeah. Uh, you should door to match. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, anyway, I, I send the Huckberry website out a lot to folks who are looking for watches, you know, under under like four grand because they've got a phenomenal selection and that's not all that common. Yeah. It's really it's true. not. So anyway. Anyways. This video is brought to you by iRestore. Are you balding? 
I'm not, but many uh, folks are, including my friend Sam, and many of those folks want to be solution-oriented, and iRestore yes. is a phenomenal solution um, to the problem that they are facing. iRestore is a laser cap that consists of lasers and LEDs. The laser and LED combination is so that they get complete coverage. And what that does is it's something called low-level light therapy, and it's just like watering plants except for your hair. Hair is either in the process of growing, resting, or falling out, and the light energy from these lasers and LEDs acts like water and nutrients that are absorbed by your hair follicles to keep your hair in its growing phase. It's amazing. The technology yeah. is FDA cleared, it's clinically proven, uh, and it's non-invasive. And I want to show you guys some before and after photos of the folks that have trusted iRestore. Completely. So, uh, this is also on their website, so you can check them out too. It's unbelievable. I mean, look at the before and after here. This guy's crown has a lot more hair. This guy's entire scalp has a lot more hair on the top. Yeah, it's it's not a joke. I've actually recommended it to two, uh, three of my friends personally, um, and they've all picked it up. And, and they have had phenomenal... Experience and they have hope because again, it just started right in the last three weeks. So they have so far phenomenal reviews of the experience, right, of the wearability, and they really believe in the data and the and the, and the results that that they're working toward. Yeah, I mean, you said a good friend of ours, his kid is like, "Where's your hat?" Yeah, your hat? that's right. Yeah, yeah, if he's not wearing the iris store hat, his son literally, you know, like, "Daddy, where's the hat?" You know, it, it's the truth. Yeah, low impact doesn't take a lot of time out of your day. It's very very brief, and you can use our code Theo and Harris to get an exclusive. $400 off the pro device. It's a terrific offer. I highly recommend that if you are being solution oriented about your balding, you head on over to Iris Store and you, uh, you pick it up. Let's start at the beginning. Um, I would say one of the earliest Rolex mistakes was uh, was in the 19, I suppose the 1950s. Uh, it was the uh, GMT, first generation GMT. Ah, uh, I think that was a huge mistake. Yes. Uh, Rolex made their bezels out of uh, Bakelite, which yes. was a which is a plastic, um, and it's beautiful. Those watches were absolutely gorgeous, yep. um, but they had to be <laughs> recalled almost immediately. They is were... it recalled or is it recalled? It is recalled. Uh, I, it is, I recall that? that those bezels were and they had to be recalled. Yeah, with Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah total recall. <laughs> uh, anyway, so so those those bezels had to be recalled, and a lot of these watches, which their reference is 6542, um, those watches today are equipped with later aluminum bezels because Rolex realized very quickly, oh, geez, we should have never done that. That was a mistake. Yes. Um, they're incredibly fragile. And even though the, the GMT is more of a elegant sports watch than the Submariner, which is really meant to be beat up, right? Of course, yep. GMT's by pilots, and pilots are they're more elegant. They're not really doing any manhandling, you know, not doing anything crazy. Yeah. Um, so they decided, okay, let's use this alternative material, and it was a fucking disaster. Yes. Now, I love uh, Bakelite. I think it's super cool. It is. A lot of Bakelite radios and stuff from that time, too. Yeah. It was very popular. It was really the birth of plastic. Right. Yeah. Those Bakelite bezels, just the bezels, are worth dozens of thousands of dollars if intact. I once saw a completely broken up, completely broken Bakelite bezel, I'd say probably conservatively in 10 pieces, maybe wow. more, and some wow. of them very, very small. Uh -huh. um, that sold for like $10,000. Wow. Um, wow. So it's unbelievable how expensive the Rolex, Rolex lust is insane. It's insane. It's insane. So that is a really early Rolex mistake. But anyone on the QC line back then didn't see anything wrong with those watches because that's how they were supposed to be. It was also very common material and everything like that. Yeah. But there's a, what would, we'll get into later. I hand you a watch with a Bakelite bezel. Oh, yeah, it looks good. Whatever, it goes on. Right. Then we get into this later, which is not that. Right. Uh, and the next generation of errors that I think came with Rolex, uh, you know, mistakes that Rolex made were, were improperly sealed dials, improperly varnished dials. Sure. Um, uh, Explore 2, is that what we're talking about? Well, I'm talking about, well, well, that's even later because that's the problem persisted into the 90s. Yeah. Um, but go back. I mean, go back into the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, literally nonstop up until the mid 90s. Uh, and the last watches that this happened to were the, I believe, six. Ooh, 16550s or something like that. It was an Explorer cream dial reference. These yep. watches were born white and turned to cream because the dials had had had, had faulty varnish, and then the, the the white the white you know dial was subject to the aging of the you know of the sun and different elements. Yep. But this happened way earlier, and it happened in a much less subtle fashion. Uh, it had about black dials turned brown, uh, uh, yes, blue yes. dials turned purple, and not always evenly. Sometimes mm -hmm. just with bizarre 
you know, formation. Yep. This cause, what we call patina. Um, some patina is a beautiful asset. Some patina is just an ugly, you know, reality. Yep. It's really a matter of taste. It's not entirely subjective because we can all kind of agree to some degree what is beautiful and what is ugly. I, I have that. I don't think I've ever showed you a picture. The watch I told this big long story about this guy that stole it from me and then yes. he ended up having a clothing brand yep. that I liked. Yeah, yep. yeah. That watch was poorly patinaed. It right. was gross. But I was like, well, that's kind of cool. It was, right. it was a weird reference. But it was like turning green and stuff. And it was yes. like way too far. Right, yes. exactly. Um, generally speaking, the brown tones, the you know, the purple tones. A good example is the early uh, yellow gold uh, Submariners. Mm -hmm. um, they they their blue dials turn purple, and now they're called purple haze dials, and they're wild. And yeah. those dials are worth <clears throat> dozens of thousands of dollars. It's wild. Yeah, and, you know, just the dials. Yeah. Screw the watch, right? Screw the watch. So, don't even bring the watch to the event. Don't even bring the watch to the event. So. The reality is with these two mistakes so far, we had one one mistake that was a matter of, they didn't really crash test, right? They didn't really test for durability, yep. fine. Yep. And then the second mistake, I gotta give Rolex a little bit more of a pass on, because I how, would agree. how would they have known that the varnish wouldn't have up, upheld in the sun, right? Especially, I feel like now in 2023, there's different testing. It's like, well, we exposed it to this and that. Back then it was like, you, I don't know. It's a fantastic dial. You cool. find out with time. Yeah, exactly. And then as soon as you find out that the varnish was not what it needed to be, mm -hmm. Rolex would offer to replace the dial on your watch free of charge, uh, and and Rolex would clearly, as those dials came out, would edit their formula, yep. and they would better and better and better their product. Yep. Right? And of course, people were like, well, I want the one that did that. That was cool. I Ex want that. Exactly. And before you move into the next thing. Yep. The difference there, the first difference is if I passed you the watch and said, is this wrong? You'd say, no, it's correct. We'll move on. The second one is these are problems at scale. Yes, exactly. Which we'll get into again at the end. Exactly. Now, I think that the, the next mistake, the next Rolex error that you can kind of point to in history uh, would be the would be aluminum GMTs, Rolex reference 16710, which is bringing us pretty close now to the error that we found, uh, you know, through Bark and Jack. Yeah. Um, the reference 16710 was the last reference that Rolex manufactured of the uh, aluminum Pepsi watches. They discontinued the Pepsi for, geez, like over 10 years, uh, which was wild, maybe yep. even like more than that. Then they brought it back in white gold, and of which, course, which yes. I, of course, own. Oh. Uh, just to remind, in case you forgot. Uh, it look, you just I, call it the white gold, right? I just call it the white gold. Yeah. But what happened here is a very, very small mistake. Yes. Okay. Um, there were, quote unquote, error dials in the 16710. Okay, they were very limited in, 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 in quantity, mm -hmm. and the only difference in these watches were uh, the error dials uh, zooming in on the text uh, on the lower half of the dial, the GMT Master II superlative chronometer officially certified, yes. the the text, the, the fonts were off. The most noticeable difference yeah. is on the Roman numeral two, you've got on the non-error dials, the standard dials, the regular watches, you have the line, you know, the traditional Roman numeral two, yep. whereas on error dials, you just have two lines. Yeah. And then I, this part, we, I, well, I don't know for sure, but it looks like we're mixing san, serif and sans serif fonts like back and forth. Yes, it's kind of odd. It's yeah. kind of odd. Uh, so anyway, this is something that people started to notice. This got, you know, noticed, and this was manufactured at scale. Mm -hmm. There are error dials out there that you can find and buy. This was noticed years ago, and the reason that these watches never really exploded, mm -hmm. I think, is because... The difference is not that wildly noticeable. And it is on the bottom text. And it's in the, the bottom text. text. Yep. It's, you know, it's enough to demand a premium, for sure. Yep. You'll certainly find a couple of buyers that care. But the natural reaction you're going to get by showing someone the difference is, oh, cool, I never heard of that. Oh, yeah, wow. As opposed to enter the Bark and Jack story, enter the Adrian story, which is, what the f***? is that exactly and then finally before we even hit that point the i feel like there'll be a few things that come up one of them being what about aluminum dials having an issue because they fade in the sunlight aluminum dials oh sorry aluminum yeah. bezels what oh, about right. aluminum bezels fading in the sunlight that i view as for a very long time that was still the leading technology until right. ceramic came out and doesn't fade but does crack whatever that isn't an error that's just a lack of 
having the materials to prevent that from happening. Right. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's it wasn't a mistake because what was the other option? Really, exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, but but so that's the history of you know the abridged history of Rolex errors and Rolex mistakes. Right. Yes. Um, now this next one, enter Adrian. This story is bizarre. This could be innocent, but I really don't think. It yeah, is. Yeah, it says something large and concerning about Rolex. Yes, exactly. Anyways, story goes, and you can check out Bark and Jack's video. I'll have that linked. Bark and Jack goes to a watch event, sees everybody with their fancy watches, mm -hmm. and one guy has an Explorer. When you look closer at the Explorer, the interesting thing that you notice is the top half of the text with Rolex, with Explorer and everything, is sans serif, which is very weird considering that has never happened in Rolex's history. Yes. If you put this this Explorer 1 next to any other Explorer 1, you would immediately notice the difference. Yeah, this I'd is say, not that, well, that one's fake. The little error, right, you would say this is fake, this looks bizarre. I'm like They messed up on the easiest part of the entire watch. Exactly. They messed up on the word Rolex. Right. So that's a cool, it's a cool thing to some. I don't know if I would prefer it. Um, I wouldn't. Yeah. I prefer the one I'm talking about later, but this one I'd be like, so the text looks worse or like not as cool as what it always has looked like. Right. You know? And I know that Rolex asked for that dial back. Would you yeah. send it back? No. No? No. I don't, I, that's the point where I'm like, I probably wouldn't even think about that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if they, if I was not thinking particularly one day, I'd be like, okay. But then if you think about it for two more seconds, like, no, just whatever. Just the approach it. that I would probably take is I would, I would probably send it back. With like, first of all, I'd want to like capture it in photos and want to write course, a story, or whatever. But, but I would probably want to, you know, try to cash that in for some good faith with Rolex. You uh, know, yeah. I would say, hey, I understand you don't want this out there. Like, I totally get it. Um, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Like, whatever. Right. It's up to you. Um, here's your dial back. Like. You know, your faithful fan, your loyal follower, you know, Christian. And then they just By the way, can I get a watch? Yeah, you know, exactly. they, by the way, yeah, can yeah. I get a Daytona or whatever the hell, you know. Right, right. And not even to be expected to get a gift. I'm just saying an allocation. Yeah, yeah. You know, course, yeah. Which, you know. That's the crazy world we're in. I didn't even expect you wanted a gift. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, exactly. my name up. Exactly. Um, and the reason I wouldn't keep it is because for me, it, it, it you know, it, it's an interesting talking piece for sure. I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I just don't prefer it over the other dial. Well, he got both dials. I know, but you can only wear one at a time. Oh, I right? see what I mean, you're saying. So you're going to wear it, you know. It's, yeah. it's like, I don't know. I feel like it's a cool story and we can move on from it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so very, very abridged version again. You can go to Bark and Jack's video, but this guy has his Rolex. He takes it to go get serviced mm -hmm. in Singapore, mm -hmm. gets the watch back, has that dial on it. And it's mm -hmm. like, what's going on? Yep. Goes back to Singapore. They're like, oh, it's a real dial, but you can have your dial back too. Then goes on to London and it's like, what is going on with this dial? London is like, well, that's weird. We've never seen that before. We need to go to, we need to ask Rolex of Switzerland, mm -hmm. the Rolex. Mm -hmm. And Rolex of Switzerland is like, that wasn't supposed to happen. That is a real dial, uh, but can we have it back? Mm hmm. No, that's the end of that story. Bizarre. So very you weird. Know, it opens the door to a few questions. Number one, why does it even exist? Because it seems like it's not an experimental dial. Right. Rolex wasn't experimenting with changing the font of their logo. Exactly. That wasn't happening. There's no other signs that show you're trying something new. Right. Yes. If it was a more interesting dial, like I don't know, with, with a different material in the loom, or you know what it the means? Like, yeah, anything that a suggests there's a difference in design. Right. Like a different idea. You're like, this, oh. This is not that. Right. You know, I could even see it, yeah, yeah, with a, with a million different different, what, what else could they have done to increase, and whether it's placement or whether it's lines of font. I could see Rolex even adding an extra line of text just as an experiment, right? They yeah, didn't want whatever. to use the graphic, you know, sure. they wanted to see it in real life. Fine, I can get that. Mm -hmm. But to change the font of their logo, there is a 0% chance. I mean, how cool would it have been if he got a dial back from Rolex that had Explorer in green? And like, it, now we're talking, now it's and like, The weirdest you know, part is, it, the watch, I don't know, maybe it got serviced in Switzerland, but it sounds like it was serviced in Singapore. Right. So this prototype dial, would have had to made its made its way from the production line, wherever that is, Switzerland, to Singapore, gotten into the service area, and then been swapped. It really doesn't make a lot of sense at all. It, right. It really doesn't. Right. Um, so what does it say? Okay. It says to me, well, one, I have no idea why that dial would even exist. Right. And it says that the Rolex service person 
deserves a tongue lashing. You know, like, is that an expression anywhere else but, but like, the Bronx? No, yeah, no, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because... It's just a weird one. I don't know why you just said this context. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, because, because, you know, if, if I was their, if I was their manager, I'd say, like, not to be a dick, but our entire brand is perfection. And right. this isn't even a small this is, step away from perfection. This yes. is a tremendous jump. A tremendous jump away from perfection. This is clear exactly. evidence that you're not fucking looking. It, well, that's the thing. Barker Jack in this video says, like, these, these brands are the epitome of precision. And I'm like, well, no, they're clearly not. Yeah, they're clearly right. not. They're clearly not. They're clearly some guys being like, all right, slap that on. Opacity would be like, it looks right. good to me. Like, Sounds clearly. like a whole lot of brand speak to Exactly. Me. And I know yeah. they make a million watches. Mistakes are bound yes. to happen. But also, sure, but that still doesn't absolve you from, well, we're still precise. One in a million is not bad. Right. Of course. I'm assuming there's more than one in a million. Right. And this was like a pretty weird thing to miss. Yes. Rolex, Rolex is a, is a company, uh, from what I understand, has very, very, very low, like, like return rates. Like, sure, yeah. you know, uh, whereas other brands have upwards, I've heard of brands with 14% of their watches get sent back to Switzerland for service wow. within the first two years. Wow. That is crazy. Okay. I don't know what Rolex's number is, but to my understanding, it is incredibly small. Right. So this error does fall, in my opinion, more on an individual than it does on an institution. Of course. Um, if, if this was happening at scale, okay, fine, fine. Then you can say, well, Rolex isn't training their technicians properly. Well, That's at scale, I'd like, not, so, yeah, something happened with the dial. So, something's it's, going on. Yeah, right. It passed something. Yeah, but not even. I mean, it would it would be a it would be a larger you know kind of condemnation of the of the people right like okay mm -hmm. the dials get manufactured but you're gonna tell me forty Rolex watchmakers were fucking blind enough to allow this to get on a watch interesting you see my point yeah well what's interesting is manufacturing with clothing that I'm doing now it's really and I, the tough part is I don't know how Rolex works I don't know how watch brands work comparatively but it's like the order comes upstairs right and they just do whatever you hand in front of them. Right. like there are these jeans that someone said take four inches off right the person read it as the pants should be four inches long did it sent it yeah so I, if it was at scale something went wrong on the production line right like something something got screwed up if it goes through that many people and, and especially rolex you think like the people building them are incredibly particular i don't know the right word intense. yeah yeah yeah, I think that this is an exception. It's nowhere clear, nowhere close to the rule. I think that Rolex is very embarrassed, and that, that 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 service guy should be spoken to. Yeah, you know, I think it's too large <laughs> of a mistake. tongue lashing. He should be spanked. <laughs> um, yeah, period. You know, right. uh, but I I do refuse to say that it's the brand's fault. It's just. It just seems so individual. It really does. It seems so individual. To me, it's just weird that that dial got there. It has to have been sent back to Switzerland and then back to Singapore. I have to him. no idea. I mean, I, I, I have no idea why that dial would exist. The only thing I can imagine would be if it's a shitty dial that was not a design thing. If they were making these shitty dials for practice, like I mean, I, you know what I mean. Like I don't know. Did they yeah, right. did they make forty Explorer dials with different fonts just to f around? That's and then possible. Put those near the service center. Yeah, dials. right. That's the other part. I'm like, do, do you just have a jar of Rolex dials right, that you like dump in? Did, did 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 each did each service did each service boutique or this particular service boutique receive thirty Rolex dials with different Rolex fonts? To, to to pick out the correct one like you know what I mean like <laughs> so, and this was one of the you know what I mean yeah, like, right. I don't know what could have happened because it's right. clearly not a design thing Rolex was never considering manufacturing this exactly. it's not as good looking it makes no sense it's exactly. off brand everything yep um, so anyway that's that's the stance and where did you want to take it next yeah basically a similar image to what you show me Christian is showing me a picture of an Air King with no three it's the, just nine at nine at three and nine at nine I saw an Explorer with the three and the nine switched really Really? That I would love that. That's because that cool. is you just made a mistake. Like yes. there is no question about it. You yes. weren't trying anything different. It got all the way through your Rolex QC. Yep. Messed up. That I would love to have. That's bizarre, right? That's incredibly weird. Here, here's here's another one. Here's what kind of what you're talking about. Rolex Explore with two nines, one at six and one at nine. Another bizarre thing. This sold for 168,000 Hong Kong dollars, which has to be at least two thousand dollars. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't know. Which is a great buy for a. I guess it's. 
I guess it's about twenty thousand dollars. I'm sure. You know, it's about twenty thousand dollars. That's um, that's a fun error, though. I'm that's not. A gonna, fun like, error. It's not going to screw me up or anything. I, I know that. exactly what the error was. Yes. I don't know how it got through everybody, but it did. Yeah. Like that's fun. I love having that because yep. I can't wait to tell people about it. I agree. The different font is like. I, if we went to that watch meetup, I would get in the car with you and be like, that watch was fake, right? And right. And you'd be like, yeah. Yeah, it was so. definitely fake. Definitely fake. And, and keep in mind, there's a long history of of fake prototype dials. And we can get into that on a separate episode. Um, but it's it's a wild world out there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, cool video, Adrian. Uh, thanks for sharing that watch. I'd never yes, seen it before. You. And it sent us down a rabbit hole that, you know, I wasn't going to go down today. So uh, thank you to Adrian from Bark and Jack. Thank and you. Thank you to you for... For, for sitting with me and having this conversation. And thank you to you for you wearing your favorite clothes. <laughs>